Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Lended Fintech's weekly news roundup. My name is Peter Renton, chairman and co-founder of Lended Fintech. I'm here with my good friend and colleague, Ton Anderson, and we have a special guest today. Miguel, how are you doing? I am great, Peter. It's good to see you and good to see Todd as well. All right. Yeah, good to see you, Miguel. Okay, just why don't you, before we get started on the news, why don't you just give a quick intro uh, to, to yourself, Miguel, so everyone knows who you are. Sure, sure. I guess... Uh, the last year and a half or, or so for me, it's been 110% fintech, right? <laughs> and then because I, I started hosting the, the Words and Fintech podcast early 2020, I started before the pandemic uh, actually sent us all home, but that just took a, a turn for you know, just a 10, 15x of everything so we during the pandemic we increased um the number of recordings we went up to four times a week uh we we did in the last 16 months we've done over 200 episodes and so that's the main thing i've been doing um and also in parallel i am an investor in in the fintech space as well staying on brand uh focusing in latin america the whole revolution that's going on there which is extremely exciting as well as the us Sure, sure. Well, um, you know, if, think, any, if no one has, if you haven't yet listened to the Wharton FinTech podcast, you know, it's certainly a must listen. Um, oh, for sure. Thank sure. you. Yeah, and you've had thank some you phenomenal guys. guests. You and your 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 partner over there, uh, Ryan, has had, you, know, you guys have just gotten some great guests. I mean, Todd and I are both podcasters as well. So it's good to good to have uh, more, you know, just just great content getting out there. So uh, absolutely, absolutely, and, and shout out to Ryan, Ryan Zauk. He he's been, uh, you know, a, a great co-host and also a really good friend. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's get let's get right into it. Uh, we've got a lot to cover this week and the busy news week. We're going to kick it off with Apple and Goldman Sachs. Um, this was uh, I think it was broken by Bloomberg, but they uh, Apple have. Um, Apparently coming out with a buy now, pay later product, not exactly a surprise given that they're integrated so tightly into, you know, with the Apple wallet and, uh, go, and with Goldman Sachs as their funding partner. But um, we're now seeing there's going to be two different uh, choices, apparently. It's going to be Apple Pay in four, which is exactly the same as what Afterpay does and, and uh, PayPal and a few others uh, have that sort of equal installments, no interest, pay in four installments. And then they're going to have a monthly product, which is similar to what a firm does. So, what do you guys think? I mean, a firm and Afterpay have slumped on the news their stock price, but uh, what do you what do you guys think about it? I mean, I think that's just a uh, you know a quick short term reaction. I think those companies will come back ultimately. I mean, Apple is just entrenching themselves more and more in financial services and and really keeping people um, on the iPhone with their uh, branded uh, either card through their Apple Card, then Apple Pay, then. Um, you know, this, this product as well, they just want people in the Apple, Apple ecosystem. I think Ron Shevlin, uh, you know, mentioned it's more of a, a threat to Google and, and Square and them versus, you know, uh, Klarna and uh, Affirm who are, you know, uber focused on uh, just uh, the buy now, pay later space. But I think it's a, it's a pretty natural move. And, um, you know, I think it's also while, the fanfare has been Apple. I think it's big news for for Goldman as yeah, well, and just sure. get keeps them in getting further and further into Main Street. Yep. Yeah, as they say, credit makes the world go round, <laughs> right? And and this is just more credit uh, to a product that many say it's a commodity, right? Buy now, pay later. I'm not so sure it's that it's a commodity in every case because these brands, they're they're the ones that do only buy now, pay later. They're actually generating uh, some loyalty in, in some sure. cases if, if they can, you know, they can market to a specific demographic, if they can position themselves as a certain type of firm, right? Um, so I, I think it's just more competition for, for the, the space, which is always good as, yeah. as a consumer. Uh, but I, I'm with you, Todd. I, I'm not uh, bearish uh, on on any of the two, like a firm or after pay, I think the market is, is extremely big. And as long as they, they just stay on their toes and continue innovating, uh, they're going to be okay. Well, yeah, you just got to look at the credit card market, which is monstrously big and, uh, you know, over a trillion dollars, I think in outstanding balances. 
that's where that that you know buy now pay later could easily eventually get into half of that um and uh, and possibly even more as um as people choose it as a way to kind of sort of like particularly the pay in four it's it's sort of pseudo credit because you don't there's no credit checks afterpay doesn't do credit checks apple said they're not going to do credit checks um if you for the buy in four uh type uh products so it's uh, it's sort of pseudo credit and it's just a more convenient way to to pay and i think um you know apple have the install base of I don't know how many iPhones there are out there, but let's just say it's several it's 50% hundred. of the smartphone market. <laughs> yeah. So several hundred million, shall we say, probably in the high hundreds of millions. And uh, the Apple Wallet app comes uh, standard. So that's a big install base. So I think, you know, I what I see is the credit card, the credit cards are really going to be the losers here as more and more people choose the, the buy now, pay that. I'd actually argue we've even reached peak credit card. Uh, I don't know if it'll ever get uh, higher than where we are right now. So that's, that's I'll, I'll I'll uh, I'll check you on, on that in a couple of years. Let's see where we are. <laughs> Let's see where we are. Indeed, but, indeed. But I mean, you know, think of what Apple's done the last few years. They've gone in, further into health. They've gone further into financial services. They already own, you know, kind of the App Store and. Um, you know, having people, uh, you know, 50% of the people that have a smartphone use Apple. I mean, it's just this, this ecosystem, uh, you're staying, if you're on Apple, you stay within Apple. Very few people then jump to the other one. Yep. Uh, and you know, plays like this just entrench, uh, people, uh, into those, uh, ecosystems even more. And yeah. so, yeah. you know, why would I even go outside Apple? They're, they're going to offer me what, you know, PayPal or someone else would, I'll just do it with Apple. Right. Yeah. Genius. What Apple has is is enviable distribution, right? right. And as anyone knows, in, in business, not just in the startup world, that is key. You might have an amazing product, but if if no one is getting it, you're screwed. Uh, so Apple has this outstanding distribution, right? But then they gotta perform on the other side uh, as well. Hopefully, you know, hopefully it works. This I'm I'm, I'm I am hoping that the ecosystem as a whole works because that is just going to continue pushing innovation forward. Yep. Yeah. And I, 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 I bought the first iPhone when it, ca- like the week it came out back in, I think it was 2007. And then mm-hmm. 2009, I decided to switch to Apple desktop. And uh, now I'm a hundred percent Apple. I don't have any other type of computer or watch or phone or iPad or anything. It's just, and I think that's what, uh, that, that's Apple hooks you in because everything works seamlessly together. Yep. Anyway, let's move on. Other big news that just came out uh, early this morning, uh, Revolut, the uh, UK digital bank that uh, has uh, proven to be, uh, I think, a juggernaut, shall we say, in the digital banking space. Um, they, they'd they had an, uh, uh, another funding round announced $800 million at a $33 billion valuation. Just keep in mind, I, their last funding round was $500 million at a $5.5 billion valuation. So they, uh, they've gone up. That, would, that was 18 months ago. So 6X six, six or thereabouts in 18 months. Um, you know, Revolut, uh, they're really big in Europe. There's no question about that. Um, they've been in this country, and I don't think they've got the traction they wanted. They're now in India as well. But... Uh, you know, Revolut are now the second most valuable fintech company in all of Europe, um, second only to Klarna, um, and they're not far behind. So uh, really, they have, they have now a massive, massive um, balance sheet to go you know, do what they want, basically. I'm yeah. torn. Yeah. I, I'm torn on this one, and because you know, Peter, you and I were briefly start chatting about this morning. Like, you know, their their US product is there's nothing special. No, like I, I don't know why I would go to Revolut uh, from whoever I have today. You know, there, there's no incentive for me to jump there. Uh, you know, there's not much international transfer from from U.S. Uh, at least native um, U.S. people. Um, you know, like there might be for European, um, you know, European users who might be uh, more apt to to use international transfers either between countries or. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm torn. It's like. At one point, this, you know, just over um, paying and throwing all this money at Revolut, like at what point does it actually return your investment? Uh, yeah. I, I have no idea. 
and it's it's a tricky one to sit there and analyze. I mean, great for them, um, and I'm sure that they'll just continue to, to accelerate their um, you know their marketing to to try to acquire customers. But at some point, it's like something has to give. Yeah, I, I think the what's going on here, right, is. On one end, revenue has grown in the last 18 months since the last mm -hmm. round, which is good, right? But on the other end, and I think we were talking about this, the 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 the, the multiple that is being used to evaluate the company has also multiplied, right? right. And and that is a function of just market sentiment. And by the way, it's not only in Europe yeah. that is happening almost in every region, uh, yeah. starting with the US. So it's kind of like the valuation, speaking only about the valuation, right? As, with my investor hat, as I say, um, it's kind of depend what happens if they, they double or a triple revenue in, in a year, but this multiple falls, right? Um, so you, you, you're going to need a pretty frothy and, and active market to sustain what's going on with, with Revolut and, and some other companies. Um, and there's no guarantee that's going to happen. So, you know, I'm 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 obviously happy to see a a, a, a fintech grow like this, but uh, it's, it's it's I don't think it's a slam dunk yet. No, I, I actually think I mean, you know, Revolut. There's going to be some massive digital banks that will have tens of millions of users, possibly hundreds of millions if you go globally, um, that are going to be big winners. And you know, that's so when you look at it that way, you know, Revolut, it could be it could be worth 200, 300 um, billion dollars um one day. That's what they're counting on the investors, but it could also be worth yeah. one billion dollars. And um that's you know it, it could be if, if they don't have a differentiated product and they don't get the traction that they have. Because right now they're more than a hundred X, hundred times revenue is their valuation. And that uh -huh. is that is frothy in anyone's in anyone's book. And um so they like they've got to they've got to execute, so they've got to grow into that valuation. And uh now I one thing I will say is that Revolut and um, Nikolai uh, he is a great executor. He is yeah. uh, a workaholic and is, they churn out products quicker than anybody. Back when I, I visited their office uh, a few years back and they had a neon sign saying, get shit done. Um, that was on the, they've, they've since removed that, but, um, <laughs> but that's, that's kind of uh, their, their attitude. And so they've really, really, you know, if anyone, I mean, they, they've, they've got it, they've got a shot at it. They've got a shot at being the, they got the shot of being, being the biggest financial services firm um, in on the planet, but uh, that's there's a lot of a lot, a lot of work to do before they get there. Makes me think that eventually down the road they're going to use some of this cash to just acquire, oh um, yeah, uh, you know competitors who are who are starting on the downside and just scoop up, and all of a sudden it's like, all right, Revolut and traditional banks are the only game in town uh, in you know whatever uh, yeah. market. Yeah, I do think though. Places like India and Latin America um, are two areas where there's still a, so much room for uh, people to find your product uh, and to acquire customers. I know New Bank is a is the success story in terms of the digital banking, but still, there's hundreds of millions of people that don't have access still in yeah. both India yeah. and LATAM, and there's just still huge opportunities um, when you think of the grand scheme of things. Right. And, and Revolut is eyeing India, right? Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So some of this is definitely behind that in terms of India. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's what they're looking at. They're looking at can this can this company have a hundred million hundred million customers in India, you know, fifty million customers in Latin America, and uh, continue to, to you know grow in uh, in the US and in Europe. So anyway, we need to move on because we uh, have only got through two stories and there's several to go. <laughs> um, there's not a slow news day. In no, no, there isn't a slow news day anymore in, in fintech. Um, so I want to talk about TikTok um, and TikTok has banned um, financial services ads and uh, I am not a heavy user of TikTok or a user at all. I have, it, I have the app on my phone to check on my son, who is a, who is a heavy consumer of TikTok videos. Um, and uh, he, was explaining, so he was explaining to me that one of his comments got a thousand likes and he was very excited. Uh, but uh, <laughs> anyway, TikTok, what, TikTok has a lot of educational content out there. It's also got a lot of crap 
that uh, yeah, and they, they, but but basically they've included in this ban is anything from lending, credit cards, buy now pay later, crypto, wealth management, and other uh, and other areas as well where you can't if you're in that if you're in that area which that's basically fintech. I mean, it's basically all of fintech can no longer advertise on TikTok, and I think that's a it's a bummer. Um, a lot of these companies are using social media influencers to really grow their grow their customer base, and a few bad apples have caused uh, have caused a real. A real yeah, problem. It's a, it's a terrible move because ultimately, even if you're making a video on TikTok and you're a bit of a sleaze ball, I mean, ultimately you have to go to a, um, you know, a platform to then perform a crypto trade or perform like there's safeguards there. I mean, just because you're listening to someone doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to. Uh, a lender and taking out a hundred thousand dollars. Like, I don't know. It seems well, like I, that's an overreaction. Yeah, it's, I agree. It, what do you think, Miguel? So, I mean, it's a, it's another reminder that this is a regulated market, right? Mm -hmm. um, and not just for the creators, but also for TikTok. Right. Um, but I mean, if, if you watch TV ads, right, you know that those are highly regulated and the companies advertising there, they've really thought through, right? And then there's, you know, there's, a, there, there's, there's guidance behind it, right? That we haven't seen uh, as much of that on, on TikTok and just social media. I, I think it's just going to catch up. I, I can imagine the regulators are looking at it. Um, and I think there's more to the story. I think uh, TikTok... Uh, it's, it's having conversations that we don't know about. Yeah, yeah, quite possibly. And I think, you know, it's, it's a pretty big platform and it hopefully this is just sort of a let's just clean everything out and slowly bring responsible yes. things back. That's, and you start seeing you the, the, the disclaimers at the bottom uh, of the screen pop up and <laughs> stuff like that where it's uh, protecting TikTok. Because, you know, I, I guess the question would be, if someone sees a video, who are they suing? Are they suing TikTok because they saw it on that platform and whatever content creator? Or are they suing Robinhood or wherever they made this crazy trade? They're probably going to TikTok because that's the yeah. one showing. So that that's probably you know playing into this as well as as Miguel was was saying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, I want to move on. All, all the big banks uh, released earnings uh, in the last week, and I'm not going to go through those at all. But there was one thing that caught my eye um, on the Bank of America, um, you yeah, know, second quarter results, and that was their their digital engagement, which, you know, it's uh, it's it's pretty good, I would say. I mean, they've got as far as their scale, it's 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 really good. I mean, they have 40.5 million digital users, up from 39 million a year ago. Keep in mind that's up that their second quarter. Last year had a big bump. So this is after the big bump they had in the second quarter due to COVID. So still, they're, they're still growing their digital user base. Certainly not growing it fast. Mobile um, was at thirty one point eight, up from thirty one point five. So pretty flat um, there. But you know, that's uh, we got it. We 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 keep we talk about Chime and all the others. And I I, I know for me, I sometimes forget this that the biggest digital um, banks are <laughs> traditional banks by far. I mean, yeah. the, the two other numbers in our little guide that we have here uh, for the new show, 85% of mortgages um, were done digitally, 77% of direct vehicle loans. So 85% of mortgages done digitally is huge. Com you know, Take that number two years ago. They didn't reference it in the article, but I'm sure it was you know, maybe 25%. Yeah, probably maybe. Less. Probably less. Yeah, I mean... I, I think obviously it's good for Bank of America. It's good for consumers, but you gotta remember this is pretty much fintech 1.0, right? right? Th these are the same services that were provided in the branches that are now being digitized or have been digitized, um, and that's not the exciting part today of fintech, right? The exciting part are the companies that are reinventing. <laughs> Uh, financial products and and just building new pipes, uh, so it's good. But you know, I don't I don't think it, it, it it's that exciting uh, to me because again, these are the same products just yeah. applied online. They've just they, exactly that's a really good point. Really good point. Okay, let's keep moving on. Um, 
I want to mention Sunlight Financial. They are uh, a company I know really well. They've been a supporter of Lendit for a while, and they had uh, they sort of fly under the radar. They don't get a lot of press, and even for this, even when they started trading, there wasn't a whole lot of press about uh, about it. So they they completed their SPAC merger last Friday. They started trading on Monday on the new, on the New York Stock Exchange, and uh, you know they. Um, they had a pretty good first day, but they've now traded down about 10% from their opening trade. And this is this is the opposite of Revolut. Okay, here's a company that is growing really well, 81% top line growth, and they're and they're and they're making money. They're making good money, like 40% margins on adjusted EBITDA basis. And uh, so this is uh, you know, and they're not they're worth one 1.35 billion was the valuation on the, the day they went public, the day they started trading, and. Uh, you know they are they're a solid company i know i'm a, I'm a customer i actually financed my solar panels on my house through through, through sunlight financial and uh, mainly just to see to see their process and see how it all worked and i was it was a wonderful experience and uh you know i i feel like the companies like this that make money and grow they're growing solidly it's a big space solar solar panel financing is is going to continue to grow for some time and um you know they're not getting they're not worth 33 billion they're only they're only they're only worth 1.35 solar's yeah. that you know as as more of the younger um generation begin to move into home ownership um you know in the next few years um you know solar's a huge opportunity because they're a lot more environmentally um savvy uh the younger generation than even mine and and ones uh, previous to mine, so I think your you know solar lending and in, in that space I think is a good one to be in, uh, and being profitable already is is an added benefit. Uh, so I think there's a, a a fair amount of upside for a company like Sunlight. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, who who knows uh, how how it continues? But this might be the the ideal SPAC candidate, right? There, there's right. been a, a lot of yeah. a lot of SPACs floating around. Some are not performing that well, uh, but if, if you have a solid company, you know, with good numbers, good bottom line, that maybe doesn't doesn't have the name recognition that uh, you know some some direct to consumer brand would have, but wants to go to market. And you know, the, I think this is actually a good candidate. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there should be more spec deals like this one and, and less in general. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Good point. Okay. So moving on, um, I want to talk about Green Sky. They're in the news recently. They have it's an interesting segue because Sunlight and Green Sky are somewhat competitive these days because Green Sky is moving into home. Um, Sunlight is moving into home improvement loans. Find, uh, they were fined um, $2.5 million, forced to refund $9 million in loans. This was really a little bizarre to me. I thought like there were 2,800 instances where the consumer complained about not authorizing the loan and they received neither a refund nor a write-off which is just uh bizarre to me so it's uh clearly there's something going on and it's probably it's 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 probably not 100 percent green sky's fault i'm guessing they're working with a whole bunch of contractors who just want to sign the deal and say okay let's get this let's get this deal done but still not a good thing i mean that that's what it seemed like was that it was who they're working with ultimately was like yeah you know let's, let's get this loan through um, and then in, you know in, in many cases the customer didn't even know until they got the bill in the mail and and their first monthly payment was due right and so that's uh, you know i guess the other question is where's the money well i imagine they didn't i mean that these people didn't pay cash and take a loan out i imagine that they were waiting to pay and they, suddenly they had a loan yeah, yeah I, wonder, I, I wonder what like did the money go straight to the um you know the contractor is the money like if they didn't know the money that the they didn't know they had a loan where that money go because obviously if it was in their account they probably would have saw it so I, i'm a little did, confused did they spend didn't elaborate it? <laughs> yeah maybe, maybe some spent it which is why <laughs> maybe those 2800 didn't get uh, you know, retribution for it, but I don't know. Yeah, it seemed uh, a bit of a a shifty. This this shifty has thing. echoes and smells a little bit like the Wells Fargo scandal a couple of mm -hmm. years ago, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they they're not opening accounts, but I think part of the Wells Fargo problem was that they were also 
opening accounts and issuing new loans. Uh, they, this very much sounds in that direction. I was actually surprised of the fine. It very much is a, a slap on the wrist. Um, you know, I, I would think it would be harsher. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I like Green Sky. I think they've been uh, they've done some really innovative things. Um, I'm hoping it's not uh, it's not sort of a systemic problem inside the company, and that's just they're working with a few bad contractors. But our time will tell. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, I want to talk about digital currencies. There was some news out of the European Central Bank this week. They have been uh, they, they've been looking at digital current at a digital euro for some time. Um, Christine Lagarde, the, the president of the ECB, is uh, very bullish on a digital euro, and they've decided to start uh, the investigation phase. And she even worded this as this is the first step towards the digital euro. Um, is an investigation stage is going to take 24 months. We're going to look at uh, design, distribution, and all other issues. And uh, it's it's bullish for CBDCs um, for sure. And uh, I think you know if uh, the ECB does it, there's going to be a lot of pressure on the Fed to to be starting to move this direction too. I mean, I'm just excited as a, a a watcher and a consumer of fintech. Like the next five years is going to be just insane the amount that's about to happen, not only with CBDCs, but you have the whole DeFi ecosystem beginning yep. to get more consumer and um, you know friendly to the to the layperson. Uh, you have all this stuff in digital banking. I mean, you know, we're about to to have quite the uh, period here and you know stuff like this to me is is only uh, positive news. Yeah, excited excited to watch how this uh, evolves. I you know we have we have examples around the world uh, of, of markets that are moving much faster, and most of them tend to be developing markets, right? So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, because what happened with open banking in the UK, it's been copied, right, in other markets as a model. So it's going to be interesting to see if they have that same effect or if you know, those models are going to be led more by emerging market countries that are acting much faster on digital currencies and particularly stable coins. Right. Well, I think it's pretty, I think it's inevitable we're going to see a, a digital, a central bank digital currency in this country, in Europe, in obviously China, uh, UK, around the world, there'll be multiple, by the end of this decade, there'll be every major central bank will have a digital currency. I think that's inevitable. It's just a case of how it's implemented. I think there will be different flavors of that. You know, I don't, I don't agree with what Jay Powell said uh, today in Congress saying that, uh, you know, when you have a central bank digital currency, there's no need for Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrencies. Uh, I don't think he quite uh, understands the uh, the crypto space yet and the <laughs> DeFi world that, uh, that that is that is sort of coming that is growing up around us. But and it is it is a really exciting time to be in fintech. I think this decade is going to be way more exciting than the last decade. And I think that points to our last article, which uh, which you shared, uh, Miguel, with uh, the amount of VC dollars. Why don't you just uh, tee that up for us? Yeah, I, I thought that was that was fascinating. You know, we're we're probably at the end of of the last stage of the pandemic, uh, hopefully, uh, knock on wood, mm -hmm. and that has just unraveled this wave of of investments that were maybe sitting on the sidelines uh, for the last year or so, and and basically the last quarter, Q two was the biggest quarter first in VC in history, in VC in general. Um, but out of that, about $33 billion um, went into FinTech. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. $33 billion, that was a total VC. But one-fifth, one of every $5 went into FinTech, right? So that is, that is just impressive. And what I like about that is that it's a combination, right? You have the mega rounds, like you know, Revolut, although Revolut is Q3, but you know, that kind of huge round. But also you have a lot of early stage that is particularly being funded in emerging markets, right? And that is arguably where you need even more financial um, innovation. So it's it's exciting to watch. Yep, yep. I'm I'm so bullish on the emerging markets, particularly Latin America. I know you're uh, you're bullish on that area as well, Miguel. And I think uh, we're going to see 
I, I feel like more fintech investment, uh, I don't see it slowing down anytime soon because there's so many good companies that are starting to get scale that are going to need more investment to, to really hit the ground running. Anyway, we are out of time, so I'll have to call, have to, have to um, end it here. Miguel, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Todd, thank you as always. Um, thank you all for listening and, or watching, and uh, have a great uh, weekend, and we'll be back same time next week. Okay, see Thank ya. you both. See ya.